specifically this goose. <laughs> the wage gap has not been closed, damn it. Oh no. <laughs> this is amazing. The US dollar, which is based on the American economy, is more stable than most relationships. What's up everyone, it's Oliver. Today I'm gonna be doing something I have been waiting so long to do, and we're gonna be reviewing the Class of 2021 Software Engineering Profile for the University of Waterloo. I had so much fun with the 2020 Class Profile, and I'm really excited to see what the 2021 Class Profile is going to look like in comparison. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Vanessa for reminding me that I said I would do this, so here it is. So right off the bat, the first thing that you notice is that it's completely different this year. Screw PowerPoint. PowerPoint is for plebs. We're gonna make our own freaking website. Okay, so in this about section, I can't help but notice. So we got 92 graduating students, software engineering, XXI, or sexy. I'm gonna be calling them the sexy class for the rest of this video. Important note, the sexy profile is not affiliated with the program at the University of Waterloo in any way. And I just wanna give a shout out. It's a long website. I just want to give a shout out to these amazing people who helped put this thing together and the website. So thank you so much because I'm going to have a freaking riot with this. So in total, 66 out of 92 graduating students and seven who were in software engineer but transferred out responded. I think this response rate is a bit lower than last year, which is a little disappointing, but what can you do? We also have a bit of a curveball. Last year's class graduated into the pandemic. This year's class had some co-op terms during the pandemic. And important note, all income is expressed in Canadian dollars at a constant exchange rate of one US dollar to 1.3 Canadian dollars, which has actually strengthened in recent days. I love this, I love this starting tagline. During a time at Waterloo, the sexy class experienced many firsts and witnessed various noteworthy events, which we will list for you below. Spring 2016, Harambe dies. Oh no, not the gorilla. <laughs> Oh my god. R slash U Waterloo wins the meme war against R slash U of T thanks to a goose tattoo. Let's see. Oh no. Oh no. If this post receives 2,000 upvotes, I will tattoo a goose on my ass. Specifically this goose. Oh no. Let this be the nuclear ship that ends the meme war. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Tattoo parlor consultation book for tomorrow. The tattoo will happen. Work in progress. Oh my god. Here it is. I can't- this story is- this story is playing with my emotions. What the f- <laughs> Oh no, not safe for work. Alright, I'm gonna have to blur it if it's too not safe for work. <laughs> no way! <laughs> oh my god, I am so glad I did not skip over this amazing meme. <laughs> this is- this is the best start. Sexy class, you're freaking killing it already. Oh no. <laughs> Donna Strickland receiving the Nobel Prize in Physics. I know, it's like a big shift from what I was just talking about, about a goose on someone's ass. But this is important because Donna Strickland receives a Nobel Prize in Physics, and it's important for Waterloo because she probably went there. But guess what? She also went to McMaster. All right, so I'm gonna skim through most of these sections and I'm gonna dig really deep into academics, co-op, finances, miscellaneous, and some future stuff. So let's start off with some quick demographic and background information. Women made up 21%. Most people were born in 1998. We have a significant number of respondents who are Caucasian or East Asian. About 7% are part of LGBTQ community. According to the official headcount, 12.9% of the students are international students in the class. So I think this number has actually gone down since last year, but last year it was about 50% of domestic students had immigrated to Canada. This year, it's only about 40. 66% of respondents are from Ontario, of which 
66% came from the GTA or Toronto area. 45% of respondents' mother tongue is not English. Wow, that's actually pretty crazy. This section always kind of blows my freaking mind. Um, income of families averaged about $96,080, which is a lot more than the median. There are a lot of families making a lot of money sending their students to Waterloo. Now, naturally, if you have a little more money, you might have higher expectations put on you and also a little bit more of an advantage when it comes to tutoring. This is pretty nuts. There are more parents with masters and doctorates combined than those with a bachelor's degree, which is absolutely crazy. And the fact that there is 10 people with a doctorate and 31 have master's degrees. They're parents. Bro, <laughs> who are these parents who all collectively got together and were like, Waterloo Software Engineering, that's where we're sending our kid. All of the doctors. Now this part's insane. The OSS average for the class was 96.5%. Do you guys not mess up? Like, that's insane. You guys are so smart. Just over half of the respondents did not take part in an enriched program, the most popular being AP and IB. Only 5.6 of respondents did not know how to program prior to U Waterloo. So you clearly have to be a little bit of a child prodigy to get into this crazy school. All right, so class Average went whoop over time after 1B. 14% of respondents failed at least one course, so there you go, it can happen to a lot of people. So we got a lot of other stuff about courses, favorite, least favorite, yada yada. Not gonna talk about everything. So looking at attendance, there's no clear correlation between self-reported attendance and grades. It appears that attending all classes benefited respondents academically. I don't know who these people are at the bottom here, 10%, 20% of classes attended. This one especially, 15% higher than the average. What? How? Fun fact, even though 50% or so came from enriched programs, it did not appear to benefit respondents academically. Respondents who had a 95 plus average appeared to perform better than those who had a lower entrance average. This could imply that students who have a 95 plus are slightly stronger students academically. Sleep. On average, respondents performed worse if they slept more than 8 hours. So, you know what that means. Get your sleep schedule in check if you want to get those good grades. Talking about co-op. Big collage of co-op companies. Hot damn. And just like last time, 68% favorite work location is the US. 39% was specifically in California. And now we get into the salary averages, my favorite part. Average hourly compensation per co-op term started at $21 and made its way all the way up to $60. You know what that is in a yearly salary? That's $120,000 and they haven't even graduated yet. For example, San Fran housing is between $1,500 to $2,500 per month, presumably for a one bedroom. This is definitely something important to consider when you're looking at these numbers, is that San Francisco, where all the people want to work, is expensive as heck. As respondents gained more work experience, they applied to fewer jobs and found more jobs outside of Waterloo Works. Co-op term one, the average amount of applications in Waterloo Works was 80, and externally was 90 or so. The average number of interviews stayed pretty consistent over each co-op term except the last, and the average number of offers stayed pretty consistent except the last, which presumably is because of the pandemic. But overall amount of applications went down, but that doesn't mean it went down a lot. People still have to apply to like 60, 50, 40, 30 jobs. 91% of respondents worked as a software engineer slash web developer every term. For students who are looking into co-ops and are gonna be doing their own interviews, don't feel so bad if you miss an interview or even if you're late to one. Happens to everyone. All right, this is a pretty cool story. I waited in the TZ lobby at T plus five minutes. My name hadn't shown up, so I double checked and it was actually a phone interview. By some miracle, I had a laptop, barged into a random office and pleaded to use the room. Luckily, the worker let me use the room for 30 minutes, pulled up a chair, somehow ate the interview and ended up getting the offer and taking it. My guy, good freaking work. <laughs> All right, so this guy was late 15 minutes to his interview, also got the offer. I don't understand. How are these people showing up late and still getting job offers? They're either insanely good or everybody should show up late to the interview so that they have less time to interrogate you. 
So favorite co-op experiences, we got California. Too many to pick, California. California, apparently California is a good time, who knew? There is no clear correlation between grades and salary. In other words, high GPA doesn't imply that you'll have a good starting salary on your co-op term. Many companies are aware that grades are not a good indication of how performant a student can be during co-op. This suggests that if you want to optimize for getting the best co-op or highest salary, you should probably work on side projects rather than caring so much about a high GPA. The wage gap has not been closed, damn it. It's difficult to determine which portion of compensation is due solely to gender bias as opposed to other causes. The other variables include a difference in interests, work location, type of work, etc. We also don't have such a large data set for women because there are about 30 to 42 men and only 8 to 9 women who responded to co-op salaries. All right, now we're talking about hackathons. Hackathons can be a really competitive event and usually the students at Waterloo win all of them, so get wrecked. But more importantly, respondents who attended at least one hackathon earned 33.6% more on average than those who didn't attend any. In other words, students who show a passion for building projects get better job opportunities than those that don't. So go to one hackathon, get paid a lot more. Moral of the story, you just have to go to one. It's important to note that students who are not involved in software-related extracurriculars still find good jobs. Many software engineering students and faculty encourage pursuing interests outside of software, which makes perfect sense because when you're spending all of your day doing software, it could be nice to change it up every once in a while. Also important to note, side projects are often seen as the closest thing to software work experience, making it a great time investment to compensate for any lack of work experience. There's your life hack, do side projects. Software engineering students cooked often, 77% doing so on a daily basis. That's actually pretty surprising. I would expect with like this crazy money they're making to just spend it all on like going out every day, but maybe not. <laughs> that being said, doesn't mean respondents are master chefs, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike high school, over half of respondents were not involved in any extracurriculars during undergrad. I don't know how that's possible and you guys still got a job. That's insane. Like, congratulations. But how? I need these life hacks. <laughs> we hope that future SEs will buck this trend of disengagement. Come on, guys. You gotta get engaged. Get part of the university life. Oh, man. Dude, this is gonna be... F it's 45 minutes already. Shit. Have you struggled with mental health? About 50% said yes before or during. Do you feel like an imposter? 80% felt imposter syndrome over their university years. And to this, I say to everybody going into software engineering or any engineering for that matter, you deserve to be there. You shouldn't feel like an imposter. You are going to become a great engineer and I believe in you. So there you go. No more imposter syndrome for you. 54% of respondents reported some form of controlled substance for recreational purposes. MDMA, LSD, guys, what are you doing? Oh, not the C word. <laughs> About 33% spent half their degree in a romantic relationship. God damn. 25% spent their entire degree single. Only one person was not single through their entire degree. Wow. Well, that doesn't bode well for my relationship. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Software engineers most commonly had one relationship through university. One respondent answered they had 20 romantic partners during their degree. I don't even know how that's possible. What, like every three weeks is a new girlfriend? Like, come on. <laughs> what a Casanova, omitted as to not skew the graph. Thank you, my statisticians, for doing that. As one might expect, a majority said they didn't have sexual partner before university. That changed to only 26% of respondents saying that they never had one during university. I love these final comments. Someone even boasted having nine sexual partners during their undergraduate studies. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. The US dollar, which is based on the American economy, is more stable than most relationships. <laughs> Alright, let's get into finances. I don't actually remember this section from the last one. Majority of students didn't have much debt and paid off their school expenses, which is very good. Amazing start. A few people in equities, a few people in fixed income, 
Three people did derivatives trading. That's nice. I actually just got started doing that myself. Two people cryptocurrency. With great wealth comes great responsibility. All right. 50% did not take any student loans. Co-op provide the opportunity to have an income every four months, which may be a factor in allowing students to avoid the need for loans. This, this right here, this sentence is why I think Waterloo is one of the most popular universities right now. If engineering school wasn't as expensive, maybe this would be different. Who knows? All right, I just spliced the video. Miscellaneous. Let's talk about burnout, baby. Respondents felt burnout in 3.34 out of 8 academic terms. About 42% of the time. That's insane. I mean, I can relate, but damn. <laughs> Who decided to ask this question? Nobody was involved in a physical fight outside of martial arts. Why? Why was this even a question? <laughs> Back in first year, when the Facebook chat was still active, someone changed a name to Software Engineering 2022 because of the brutal ECE 105 final we had. The majority of software engineering students considered switching to another major. This holds true with my personal experience. I've thought of switching pretty much every year I've been in my engineering degree. <laughs> And only four respondents pondered leaving university. I would be part of this category. 9.5% <laughs> switched out of software engineering and into computer science. Woo! Flexible course schedule was the main reason for switching out of software engineering. None of the transferred students regretted their decision. 70% said they would choose it again if they could go back to high school, which is very cool. Sexy class, doing a good job. Now we're getting into the future post-graduation plans. 90% of respondents had already accepted a job offer two months before graduation, which I'm guessing is when the survey was done. Post-graduation plan, 49 industry, three grad school, two entrepreneurship, one industry, and one taking a good old break. Good for you. Relocation plans, most are going to East Coast US or California or East Coast Canada. Really? Like PEI and stuff? Big tech and trading firms hired many software engineering grads. Facebook and then Citadel coming up close behind. Trade desk? Huh. Maybe I should be in software engineering. What am I doing out here? 52% feel that their postgrad plans are perfect and 91% rate their future a four to five or higher. Nice. All right, let's get into the numbers. Ah, this is my favorite part of the survey when we get to talk about full-time compensation, baby. <laughs> All right. The compensation for the first year of full-time work for respondents will average 284,728 Canadian dollars, the median being $260,000. Jesus Christ. These salaries immediately boost you to the top percent of earners, just like last year, and very close to the top 5%. The outliers of this survey blows my freaking mind. Thousands of Canadian dollars count. Over 300,000. Eight. Over 400,000. Six or six? Six. Over 500,000. Two. Over six. Who, who are these two people getting paid over half a million dollars? What? New grad profit sharing in compensation. Most had between zero and 100,000 in profit sharing, and presumably this one person who has the potential to make $700,000 in like stock options. I don't know how they calculated that, but that's pretty freaking insane. An enjoyable workplace and good compensation were biggest factors. That's interesting. I think last year compensation was the number one factor. What are the best life hacks that you'd like to share? Take the same courses as the people you live with. If you don't collect air miles, you're missing out on 10 to $50 per flight. Good point. <laughs> what is one piece of advice you would give to your first year self? Buy Dogecoin. <laughs> People are less intimidating than you think and take more risks throughout university and be yourself. Amazing, amazing advice to your first year selves. <laughs> What's the best lesson you learned during your undergrad? Cramming last minute works fantastically. Unless it doesn't. <laughs> well, that about wraps it up. I have like an hour and a half of video to edit, but I had a freaking blast making this. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel. Maybe I'll do another one of these. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. Follow me on Instagram, at Oliver Foote, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Whoosh.